Watch Transit TV right now. Mihar mo nun ang Dimensional Commentary 1. Keep watching Transit TV and stare mo for premium content. Otra vez, adios. Three perspective, referee can always call for those ones as a foul if he sees it first hand or his assistants have seen it first hand. But when the referee does not see it and the VAR has looked at it and they think it is not supposed to be a red card incident, they do not stand any rights to call the referee to that one. So I would say teams have started doing this. So I think they... Transit TV, welcome back again to the studios. Welcome back to our referees' body show. I'm here with K. Of course, you know he's a referee, a good one for that matter, a renowned one, accredited by FIFA and CAF. And uh, we come on this show every week to look at uh, some controversial decisions by his colleagues out there, especially in EPL and in Europe. Uh, every weekend, like I've said, we try to talk about football players and coaches, but somehow K and his colleagues have said that they must be the at the center of every conversation about big games, especially in, uh, in Europe. So today we are here again to look at a few of them that happened over the past weekend. And like I always say, get busy in the comment section. Let us know what you think about, you know, his views and what he's going to say about these things. And uh, if you have any ones that we will not discuss or we forgot to mention this week, put them out there in the comment section so that we can discuss them again next week. And uh, of course, uh, I will go from there. Okay, you are uh, welcome back to the show, my brother. How have you been? I'm doing great, Reggie. Good evening and good to see you once more. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, they, I mean, it is uh, another week to, for us to discuss everything that's happened in the world of football the premier league particularly but you know the fact that we are coming from the referee perspective it makes this one different because most of the times we are out discussing the coaches the players and virtually everyone seems to forget one of if not even the biggest player in the game of football who is the referee and we are here to discuss the referee so i mean i'm super excited for this one yeah, so he had K there. Now you can understand why these referees are trying to be in the center of it. According to K, they are the biggest players on the pitch. Of course, they are because their decisions most times uh, can determine where the, the pendulum will swing. And uh, most of the time it does. So with this week, we start with the Manchester United. And before we go on, uh, via, don't forget to subscribe if you have not done so. Hit the like button. Please share, share. We need at least 50 uh, likes on this one. And uh, before we start, okay, let me ask you, the Ballon d'Or just was uh, announced yesterday, Rodri mm -hmm. won it. I know how much you, you love Rodri, and I, I don't know what, it looks like the outcome of that one was what you expected. Yeah, it was, it was basically, um, it was exactly as I expected it to be. And, you know, for a very long time, I've actually been uh, clamoring for a, a defensive player to win the award just so the world understands that the award does not solely belong to attacking players because um so over the years we've seen it being narrowed down to just the goal scorers and we tend to forget the ones who are preventing their teams from scoring the goals and when you are exceptional in your position it doesn't have to be uh you know a striker or one who creates goals or one who you have to be exceptional in your position and you have to be exceptional over the years for so many years now Rodri has been consistently exceptional for club and country. So I think it was just high time, you know, a, a defensive player won it, and I'm super glad it is Rodri. So, I mean, I don't want to delve too much into the talks of Vinicius should have won and all of that. Vinicius is a superb player, uh, you know, nothing to be taken away from him. But I think Rodri deserves this one. Yeah, like I know I agree with you, but and Avias, by the way, there is a video from our studios on this one mm -hmm. out there. If you have not seen that video, please go to the channel, search it, and see. Watching that video will help you also understand how the, these decisions are made. I know, like I always say on this channel, we are, we are packed with our emotions and our allegiance to our clubs and the players that we love. But sometimes it's, a way, it's good to walk away from those emotions and try to see things from an objective perspective. So that video will help you to also understand, like Kay mentioned, their consistency is very key. I don't think uh, 
that award is usually given just because of that season. You have to be at a certain level for the number of seasons for you to be in contention to win it because we have seen players be very exceptional in one season and disappear or all of a sudden. And it would be nice to look back and there's really no legacy to somebody that has won Ballon d'Or before. This is what I feel that these people look at sometimes as well. So go and watch that video and have some more understanding or insight about how this, these decisions are made. So we we'll move to our talk of the day. The first one would be Manchester United, the penalty awarded to West Ham. On the, it is, that incident happened on the sixth minute. The game was almost uh, done and that decision made uh, United lose that game and uh, uh, of course we know Ten Hag is no more the United uh, coach. So as a referee, how did you see that incident? Do you think that was a penalty? Was it a correct call by VAR right there? Yeah, um, I will start from, uh, you know, a football lover. From being a football lover, I will tell you particularly that I'm, I'm super gutted for Manchester United. I'm so, 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 so uh, gutted for Manchester United and especially for everything Hag, because I think that match was the game that put the last nail on the coffin and, you know, eventually had him sacked. Uh, because looking back at that game, I, I'm still struggling to understand how that was a penalty. Because we all saw that incident, we saw how you know um, Mataj Delit came into the uh, game trying to defend. Definitely, he is a defender, and we have always established the fact that football is a contact sport. So you don't just give any how any foul because there was a contact. Most times, we look at the impact of the contact and how the player who you know initiated the contact had affected the other player who the contact was on. And you look at all of these things in that game. Um, Mataj Delit came in trying to defend the ball, collided with Danny Ings. It was a collision that had little or no influence on Danny Ings. Ings wanted to make a uh, you know a huge uh, the thing of it by staying on the ground. The referee on the field of play got it spot on when he decided to continue playing the game. You know the penalty was not given, but then all of a sudden the VAR calls him and say. Go and take a look at that one. I was watching that game and I was seriously believing that even after checking, he would come back and stand with his uh, initial decision that that was not a penalty. But the biggest surprise for me was when he went to the VAR, looked at it and came back and overturned his decision and gave a penalty. Because even after watching the slow-mo from the VAR and you know, going through, through it over and over, it just gives you more reason why it should not be a penalty. So you would understand with any Manchester United football or everything had when they think they were hard done in that okay, so let, let me stop you there. Sorry to call you short. I, I, the, what you mentioned right there, and I want to ask you this question as a referee. Oh, mm. you, you could see that the referee did not agree with VAR because, first of all, he was right there, was a few steps away from that incident. He saw it. Mm. He was convinced of on his decision. And he went to VAR. I believe that if... He, believed, he, he agreed with VAR. He wouldn't have taken him that long. He wanted to really make sure that they were correct. Mm -hmm. So as a referee, I want to ask you a question. Do, can, do, does VAR put pressure on referees to change the decisions? Have you experienced it before that VAR? Because from what we understand, they're supposed to just make you, tell you, go back and look at it again and maybe change the decision. Do they continue mm -hmm. to like, put pressure while they're communicating with the referee? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say um, the, VAR, the VAR puts pressure on referees, but you know, generally, the VAR doesn't necessarily come in unless there has been a clear and obvious error. That's what we are told. Yes, that is what we are told, and that is where it is surprising, especially with that game, because you know it was not such so, such a big, clear and obvious error. But the referee, when he was called by the VAR. The first thought that would come into his head is knowing fully well that the VAR would not call him unless he has made an, a clear and obvious error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't hear you. We have all been there sometime in our life when you know you think you did it right. But because a lot of people are questioning your decision, you begin to ask yourself, what if I actually got it wrong? I think that was the situation there. You know, the referee went to see the monitor and then looking at it over and over. Because the VAR, he knows, would not come in unless it is a clear and obvious error. And then at some point, he began to doubt himself. And I think, you know, he decided to go with the VAR, you know, just take the decision, 
because the VA would not call you if you have not made a clear and obvious error. But I expected him to stand on his initial decision, which was the right call by all I know. Yeah, and again, I don't know, can I ask you, because right now in England, it looks like Michael Oliver is one of the most senior referees, but uh, there are serious questions sometimes with the decision. On that day, Michael Oliver was a man on the VAR post. Yes. I don't know, based on your own decision, how do you rate Michael Oliver in, as a referee? Um, you know, there is no particular parameter to rate a referee, whether he is the best or not. It's all, you know, based on how, what you do on the pitch and, you know, how the people see you. But sometimes how the people see you does not necessarily count because sometimes people see you differently from what from how the laws of the game sees you. Because, I mean, there are lots of things on the laws of the game that, you know, referees know that the usual football fans do not know. So well, I think Michael Oliver in the Premier League still ranks as one of the best referees in the Premier League, um, you know, alongside Anthony Taylor and, you know, a few of them. But you look at the incidents that have been happening recently, you know, how he's been in the in between a lot of controversial situations. And I think it's just uh, maybe a patch. You know, we've also seen Anthony Teller in those uh, kind of situations. And even this weekend, Anthony Teller still has his own share of the controversy. So I think it's just a general thing which referring that, you know, when you keep officiating games uh, every week and the next week and the next week, definitely there'll be lots of talking points and, I mean, before you know it, people begin to draw the line and begin to put it in as a pattern. But I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with Anthony, uh, Michael Oliver, sorry. But even being one of the best referees in the world and in the Premier League, there's still room for an error because he is, this is not me holding brief for him. I am not holding brief for him because, I mean, he was, the, he was in the VAR for that game and I expected him to have done better as well. But, okay, so in that situation now, it's obvious that that call was a wrong call. Who, who are we to blame? Is it the referee or what? The, the referee, first of all. The referee, because the referee is in charge of the game. And even if the VAR um, advises you to go to the monitor and check out something that there might have been an error in that one, you still stand in the right and you still have the final decision too. We've seen several times when the referee has gone to the monitor and after checking, looking at the money. Yeah, like last on, week, yes. Um, so uh, the, the whole, the, the chunk of the blame falls on the on the referee. Okay, I agree with you. As you heard it out there, uh, Manchester United fans, and the, 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 the problem with these mistakes, and especially sometimes very obvious ones, is that they cannot be reversed. Those, that game is gone. The team has lost uh, two points, possible two points that they would have gained. And... Uh, and that's it. Then, then what you will hear now, PJM will come out and give a statement and end of end of story. The Hag has lost his uh, his uh, his job. Manchester United has dropped three points from that game, and life continues and nothing happened. And this thing will happen again. Then we move to Chelsea, Newcastle. Chelsea had a penalty, and it was. Uh, disallowed. Uh, talk us through that one and what you think should be the record. Okay, um, I think that one, everyone who saw the game and everyone who is objective in the game of football, you don't necessarily need to be a referee to actually see what happened there. And you saw, I think that's where you, some of one of those uh, moments where you comment the use of the VAR. Yes, you have to comment the use of the VAR there. And that's, that's where you, it reminds you why the VAR has been invented in the game of football. Uh, because first of all, the penalty was given. And then, uh, you know, uh, Steve Hooper, the referee, thought he had seen a push on Christopher Nkunku because he saw the hands of uh, Dan Bond on his body. But then with the VAR coming in and then they replaced, showing that there was actually the, uh, uh, there was actually Dan Bond's hand on Nkunku's body, but there was not necessarily a push. So Nkunku had just gone down so easily. And that was such an easy one for you know, for uh, Steve Hooper to overturn. So you look at the situation, Nkuku has the ball, he tries to cut back, then Dan Bond, you know, still trying to defend, being a defender, trying to defend, and just like we mentioned, football is a contact sport. Most times when there is contact, what we consider before giving a call is the effect of the contact and the, the you know, the intensity of the contact. So his hand was on Nkuku's body. Did he necessarily push Nkuku? No, he did not. So uh, I think it was a correct decision there. 
the, the, the referee, Steve Hooper, checked that one and saw that, okay, there was not so much of a contact for that penalty to have been, to be awarded, and then it was chalked up. I think it was a good one there. What about the Bruno Guimarães penalty call as well? There was a time, you know, he dribbled past into the Chelsea defense and there was a kind of collision there. Uh, the, the, the commentator on the day was saying that the foul, if there was any, it happened outside the box. That maybe that's why VAR did not intervene. But uh, did you look at that incident? Do you think it was clear that the, the, if there was any uh, any foul there, it was outside the box? Or do you are you okay yeah. with the decision? Yes, I, I'm very much okay with that decision. You look at it clearly, you'll see that the, 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 there was a foul, yes. And, you know, the, it's this kind of fouls that are subjective that the referee has to, you know, decide if he goes with it or not. And then the foul eventually happens, uh, you know, outside the penalty area. And uh, according to the, the, the VAR um, rules, the VAR does not check incidents that happens outside the penalty area unless it is a red card incident or offside. So in situations like free kicks and all of that, the VR does not come in. The VR does not come in. So the VR couldn't have intervened in that one because it obviously happened outside the penalty area. So I mean, uh, I think I'll still say good one from Steve Cooper there. I um, mean, it was a very good one. I think that was Levi Kowi who brought down uh, Bruno Guimaraes. Well, eventually uh, the referee got his spot on as well. The big one for this weekend, Arsenal Liverpool, the, the game of the weekend. Everybody was looking forward to. Of course, uh, Liverpool. We are Liverpool. We are on top of the the table before that game. And Arsenal, if Arsenal had won that game at the Emirates, they will go. I think that would have been the same point with Liverpool and Manchester United. Manchester, Manchester City will be top, and they will be second. And uh, yeah, the two two the two two draw. There were a couple of incidents I want us to talk about. The first one was at the beginning of that game, Van Dyke was seen to be kicking out on uh, Kai Havertz severally off the ball incident. There was no check by VAR. There was no call by the referee. And that incident just went on uh, scene or attended to. There was no, nothing was done about it. And the game went on. And uh, I don't know with all the noise about, you know, Respect for opponents and uh, you know off off the ball incidents in in the, in the game especially in EPL. I don't know mm. what do you think. Do you think at that stage of the game that is proper to ignore that or should it have been taken care of? Especially in this time where even delaying or the starting of games is a uh, tantamount to getting a, receiving a yellow card mm. for incident like that. I don't know what you think. You know, um, you know, just like I mentioned earlier. Uh, the VAR only intervenes in incidents that happen outside the box that is meant to be a red card, but the referee has not seen it. So in situations like this, when the referee hasn't seen that particular situation and it is not a red card situation, the VAR does not intervene. And that's just the, you know, the, the rules of the VAR. Now, can we change that rules? Maybe later it is up to the IFAB to decide which way to go next with the VAR. So, but I, I think, you know, it's just uh, one of those dark arts that teams have learned to start applying these games just to, these days, just to uh, try and get the win. We saw Arsenal do it against Manchester City with Rodri, how, you know, Kai Havertz intentionally ran into Rodri at the starting uh, minute of the game. And we also, we all knew Havertz knew exactly what he was doing. The next time uh, it was um, Thomas Partey running into Rodri as well, which eventually took him out of the game and now, Got him. Yeah, I don't know if that was what got him injured, whatever. But Rodri left that game, and that that has to be his last part in this entire season. But we we see this is dark arts that teams have begun to employ just to try and win their games. Liverpool trying to use it as well against Arsenal was not so surprising. But from a referee perspective, referee can always call for those ones as a foul if he sees it firsthand, or his assistants have seen it firsthand. But when the referee does not see it, and the VAR has looked at it and they think it is not supposed to be a red card incident, they do not stand any rights to call the referee to that one. So I would say teams have started doing this. So I think the IFAB has to as well step up their game and check, decide whether to you know, start taking a look at those ones because, I mean, the health of the players is involved.
Okay, yeah, I agree with you. So then we'll, we'll go to the the big one, the big incident in that game. Of course, uh, we know that game was locked on 2-2. A lot of people expected Liverpool to win because of the law of injuries and suspension to Saliba that Arsenal had. And within the game again, Arsenal lost two defenders as that game was going on. And somehow found themselves ahead of ahead of Liverpool 2-1. And Liverpool, of course, came back. And about uh, the six minute again, no, it's ninth minute, there was an incident where Arsenal scored a goal. I have a lot of issues, a lot of questions to ask you on that incident. The first one, for what we're meant to understand, uh, what's his name again? Uh, Anthony Taylor called a foul on Kivio. I want to find out from you, is that a foul? Secondly, there is also a rule that when you're not very sure, or sometimes an action is leading to a goal as a referee, don't call the foul. Let the ball, let the, the action finish. If there is a foul, it can only be bought back. Because I understand from my of football, once the whistle goes, regardless whether the call is wrong or right, if you score a goal, it's, it doesn't stand. Because the interpretation is that the players, the opposing players, did not react because they had the whistle. So you told mm -hmm. that's advantage. So do you think Anthony Taylor was right to call the foul in the first place? And at the time that he called that foul, for me, as an Arsenal fan, I'm talking like as an Arsenal fan now, I feel that he knew what he was doing, that he should have allowed the play to finish. Then VAR is there to help. And he can also, he can still make that same call and VAR will check it or not. All right. Now, let me just uh, clarify here. Uh, the rule about uh, a referee, when a referee is not so sure about um, uh, an incident leading up to a goal um, doesn't have to do with fouls. It does not have to do with fouls. It deals with offside. When there's, an, say, there's a possible offside situation leading up to a goal and the referee is not sure it is an offside. Now, when I say referees, I mean both the referee, the man in the middle, and the assistant referees. If you're not so sure there is a foul there. There is an offside there. Please, it doesn't apply to fouls. If you're not so sure there is an offside there, allow the game to play on. After the incident has ended, if it leads to a goal, there will be a VAR check. If it does not lead to a goal, then we can restart accordingly. But then, you know, that what that situation there was, um, you know, was a foul, not an offside. There was no possible offside situation there. And the first one was um, Jakob Kivio on Dominic Zobo's slide. And, you know, it's a 50-50 situation. Those kind of situations when a referee gives a foul, he can explain it. He does not give a foul, he can explain it as well. Those kind of 50-50 situations, you know, the referee can easily give the foul. He can easily let the game flow. So Kivio goes up to knock the ball. Uh, Zobo's slide does not go up so well. But then Kivio, Kivio gets the ball. By the help of you know having his hand on the back of on the back of Zobos line, the referee decides to allow the game to play on 50-50, no problem. But then after that one, the next incident was um, Kai Havertz on another Liverpool defender. I think that was Konate. Yes, Kai Havertz on Konate, and Havertz trying to get the ball. You could see his hand being outstretched to the ear of Konate, and you could see Konate's uh, reaction immediately that he had been hit with the uh, hit by Kai Havertz's hand. So and at that point, the referee gives the foul and he makes it look like he had given the foul for the first one, which was committed on Zobos Light, not the one by Kai Havertz. But I'll tell you that it is more of a foul what Kai Havertz did than what Kivio did. So if you're actually given a foul, it is easier to give a foul for the, for the offense that Kai Havertz had, given, had committed because his hand was outstretched. But the referee's body language is showing because he actually showed that he had given the foul for the one committed by, by uh, Kivio. So now, look at that incident. You think, okay, what he probably did there was, you know, you know what? It is a 50-50 situation. Play on. If a Liverpool player gets the ball, we continue playing. But if an Arsenal player gets the ball, I give the foul. That's more like trying to play advantage to Liverpool just, you know, to allow the free flowing of the game. Because sometimes we actually have situations where there is a foul. You want to, uh, you know, blow the whistle ball just for free flowing of the game. If you think this, the, the, you know, the teammate of the player that had been fouled would pick the ball, you just let the game keep flowing. So I think, you know, probably that was what he did there. But then when he now saw that Kai Havertz had actually won the ball 
ahead of Konate, we decided to now call the foul. So I will tell you, it is a 50-50 situation. And now there is not such a big, there is not such a clear and obvious error in that one. The, the, the reason why I don't agree with you on this one is, yeah. first of all, you've said it many times here the, about the football being a contact foot, a contact game. So yeah. I don't know why it's going to be different on this situation. And again, fine, like you said, it's a 50-50 to both of don't, them. Don't if, me, if, if, you are, if, if you are giving a foul on any of them right away, nobody would argue about it. Now, I also yeah. understand the one of letting the game flow and see where it goes. Between when the foul committed on by Kivio and Kai Havertz, they, they, we had lost like five to ten seconds. He didn't blow his whistle until Kai Havertz again beat Alexander Arnold to it. It was at the time that Jesus was about scoring the goal that his whistle went off. So that's the problem. That's where, that's where there's an issue. If Kaiba had gone up and he blew his whistle right away that time, nobody would have argued. But he let the ball flow. At that time, Liverpool's goal was in danger. Maybe he thought that somehow Trent would have prevented Kaiba from scoring the goal. That's why mm -hmm. he did not blow his whistle. And this is where I have a problem. You know, I cannot tell you exactly what he thought was because I'm not in his mind. But, you know, I need to uh, clarify that um, situations... Why this one is different from, you know, when I say football is a contact sport, there are some, there are contacts, and then we talk about the effect of contact and then the intensity of the contacts. And we have, um, you know, referees are advised to always watch out for the hands in any area of challenge. Any player uh, jumping, how is his hand going up? Mm -hmm. The second, you know, the, the, the second motion of the hand, that is the, um, you know, the returning of the hand. If a player has jumped, you know, def definitely as a human being, if you're jumping, your hand will definitely be up. So if you are coming down and the follow through of the hand gets on someone, most of the times it is not given as a foul as it is known that it is not intentional. But if there is a second movement of the hand, it is definitely given. And then when you are jumping and instead of going straight at the ball and trying to lift up your hand to, you know, uh, help you get high up to get the ball, your hand lands on an opponent's ear, anywhere around the head. Most of the times it is given as a foul. Because you look at those situations, you know that the intention is actually to get that your opponent who is you know, contesting the ball with you out of the way so you can actually get the ball. And that's why I say Jakob Kivio's situation was more or less not a foul than what we saw from Harvard. Look at that situation clearly. Kai Harvard had his hand outstretched yeah, like, I, like, I, like I said, I don't have any issues with him giving the foul. It's the timing yeah. of the glowing I, I, understand, I understand what you mean. But, you know, I, I also did not time check, check the time to know if it was about five seconds between the two situations or whatever. But then, you know, sometimes they say it is easier, it is better to take your time and get the decision right than to go immediately and, and get it wrong. So we've seen that like, you will see, we've seen situations, especially you know, in penalty areas where an incident has occurred, the referee is thinking, should I give it or not? Should I give it or not? And it takes about three to four seconds, and then the whistle finally sounds. You know, we've seen those kind of situations, but I do not know if that was what Anthony Teller was doing there. But okay. I because I well, I'm not yeah. in his mind. But I'm just saying. Well, well one thing I would say is for our viewers out there, you've heard K. One thing I can assure you guys is he is, doesn't have allegiance to any club. He tries to give his opinion on these things as straight as he can think it. My job is to ask difficult questions and to make sure that you, our viewers, there understand the minds of this referee sometimes when they make some of these decisions. Yes, as a fan, sometimes these decisions don't go the way you want them to go. But here, we're trying to help you also understand why those decisions are taken, not really if they're right or wrong, but at least you have an understanding of what goes into the mind of the referee, why they officiate these games. And uh, that's what we try to do here. So don't forget to, like I said, get in the comment section and let us know what you think about these incidents. And also, you know, sending uh, incidents as well as we watch your games all around the globe before the before next weekend. We'll bring them up here and have a conversation with them. But okay, before we go, I want to ask you something. One of my friends called in last night and said we should discuss this one. I, I believe I know what the answer is, but I want to ask you as a referee so that people out there too will understand. 
So he is a, a grassroots referee and had an incident in a game where a player took a shot towards the goal. The striker was onside and the ball hit the bar and came out. Of course, by the time the ball was hitting the bar, the, probably the striker had, a, had the striker's instinct. He anticipated the rebound and yeah. running, the ball rebounded and he scored the goal. The center referee called an offside. He said he himself was a nice man. And he told the referee that he wasn't an offside. And the referee said it was an offside. That uh, it, there is a law, a law in football that says if a striker is in an advantage position, that you call offside. And to me, I feel that was not an offside. But I want to hear your authority in this one. Let our yeah, viewers mm -hmm. there in case they come across incidents okay. like this. Okay, I mean, we see uh, and hear a lot of these kind of incidents in grassroots football where, you know, uh, the assistant referee is saying no offside and the referee is saying offside. But when we think about, uh, when we take it to a professional referee, if the assistant referee says it is offside, the referee cannot say it is not. Especially in the le in, in, in leagues where the VAR is not used. You know, so you look at all those kind of situations, it is basically... The job, the job of the assistant referee to pick offsides. So if the assistant referee has said there is no offside here, the referee has to go with it. The referee cannot say otherwise because this is his number one job. Get the offside, job, uh, offside line drawn pretty well and make sure you get the cause. So that particular situation, offside situations are judged from when, where the uh, attacking player was when the ball was kicked, was last kicked by his opponent. It is not when where he was when the ball had rebounded from the goalpost or the save from the goalkeeper. Yes, like you mentioned, a lot of strikers with you know attacking instincts see a shot coming from their teammate and then they go, start running because they are expecting the goalkeeper to parry it and then they want to convert. It's a good goal. The goal should have stood. So no upside there. As long as that striker was onside when the shot was taken by his teammate, it should have been a goal. It was onside. The middle, the center referee was saying that by the time they kicked the ball, by the time the ball was rebounding, that he was now in an offside position. I said, no, the bar or the goal post is part of the field. So it doesn't matter. Just like when you say that the ball hit the grass and came back. And because mm -hmm. he came back from the grass, the guy is now offside. No, it doesn't happen that way. So our viewers out there, Thank you, Kel. It's good having you again on the show today, and you have done some justice to these ones. Whether we agree or we don't agree, that's another thing entirely. But I know that you always give it a, your best shot when you come on this show. And uh, Via, don't let, forget to let us know what you think in the comment section, and uh, keep bringing these uh, issues as you witness them in your games. Sometimes we're not able to pick a lot of them. I know there are a few more that happened this weekend. We're not able to cover them today. So help us to you know, get those uh, incidents discussed here. And maybe in the next one, I have more, more, more than one uh, Kay or maybe one other referee will also come in and we discuss these things as they come. Thank you very much, Kay. Thank you, our viewers. And again, like I said, support this channel. Subscribe if you have not done so. Hit the like button and uh, we'll see you. Also, share it out there. The last one had a very good uh, view from a lot of people meaning that uh, these issues are important to us fans so also share with your con your friends and the fellow fans out there so that we can uh, try to educate ourselves on the referees thinking as they officiate the games that these games that we love so much thank you Kay, and i'll see you again next time ciao thank you very much Reggie. yeah bye